Most are probably aware of this, but one of the first things that led me into the furry fandom were video games. Looking back, it's kind of crazy to me how having a fascination with the Sly Cooper series as a teen would lead me into a fandom full of people creating anthropomorphized characters to represent themselves. We're not going to talk about the part Pokemon played in that journey, but the point is, being introduced to furry through the video games I liked playing, that had me wondering. I'm pretty sure franchises like Pokemon don't cater to a furry audience. Like, 90% sure. So what are the games that do cater to furries like? What are the games that are made sometimes by furries for furries like? I'd be lying if I said the result shocked me. The definition of a furry game is hardly a concrete one. Mostly because, if you're like me, you don't usually consider a game to be a furry game just because it has a few anthro characters that furries went hog wild over. Regardless, you're bound to get similar yet still differing responses if you ask enough people. Some might consider something like Night in the Woods to be a furry game due to the considerable ripple it left in the fandom or just because every character is an anthro animal. Some might say Fire Emblem is a furry game because of the existence of the shapeshifting manakeets or the Lagoos races. Those people worry me, but in my humble opinion, I mostly consider a game to be a furry game when the majority of characters involved are anthropomorphic animals. To me, games such as Fuga, Gunfire Reborn, and Rivals of Aether would fall somewhere into that net. Even so, these games aren't exactly furry enough to answer my question. At least, two out of the three aren't. I'm not looking for games that can be co-opted by the furry fandom. I'm looking for games marketing themselves to me solely based on the fact that I am a furry. I mean, what are your humans up to? This is just... oh my... oh... So, like most looking for a game to play, I decided to check out Steam, as only games of the utmost quality are allowed to be published on this platform. Also, just so you know, it is publicly announcing that you are streaming furry Hitler. I... <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, I took it upon myself to search through Steam and see what this platform had for the average furry consumer. In this video, I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of the games that found themselves into my shopping cart at the end of this search. A search that ended with me being more confused than when I started. A search to find out what the state of furry games on Steam currently is. A search that simply began with me typing furry into the search bar. Well, let's get this one out of the way. There's a lot of things that I love about Furry Hitler, not to be confused with Fox or Nightfire, is a game where I got exactly what I expected, yet was still left somewhat baffled by. Furry Hitler is a visual novel based on the titular character Adolf Hitler, but as an anthropomorphic animal. That doesn't really look anything like him, but honestly, I'm not gonna write for that change to be made. As said before, this game is a visual novel, its story opening on the day real a game ended himself. He's in his bunker, with a gun, and I'm sure you know where this is going. Happy death day to me. Hitler is essentially recording a tape so he can give his own account of events as to what happened leading up to this day. The game goes through these events via flashbacks. So basically it's a game where Hitler just goes, yeah, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here. Later in the game, I ordered a public execution and all of a sudden there was imminent sex on my screen. This is where the gameplay portion of the game is. As most games go, this gameplay is about on par with something you'd find on one of those after school flash game websites. Not like Y8 or Congregate level, but like dress up who's Elsa brain surgery kind of level. You choose items on the right side of the screen and then select a part of the girl's body their words are not mine. Touching the right part of their body with the right object will fill the fun bar. The fucking fun bar. Each girl prefers different items. Hmm, yes. I wonder what women will prefer in bed. A tongue or a feather? God damn it. Obviously, this simpler gameplay is so the game can be played one-handed. But for me to be okay with that, I at least ask that the scene is, you know, good. If it weren't for the site I'm uploading on, I would have a much more scathing review of the not safe work scene than this game about furry hurly. A question you're probably asking yourself now, is this game historically accurate? I mean, it might as well be. I've never really been one to watch porn for the plot, so you know. I lost interest extremely fast and couldn't be bothered to fact check the furry porn game about hurly. They already ended up getting my six bucks for it, 
So I can't really say much else other than I don't see any reason you should buy this instead of giving them the Adobe treatment. Most would probably consider gifting it to a friend as a gag joke, but honestly I'd argue there are so many gifts of the same low caliber you could give instead, one of them being the next game on our list. I don't think this game even needs an introduction. I'm sure a number of us are already fully aware of this one. Whether through one of my YouTuber contemporaries or the previously mentioned gag gift scenario, Furry Feet is a game similar to the previous one discussed. However, Furry Heat, a eh, Furry Heat, wait, I, I think there's actually another one out there somewhere. However, Furry Feet is only gameplay. No story segments to break it up. The gameplay is still on the same level though. This was something I was expecting when I typed Furry into the search bar. One look at the results, and you can see that the majority of these games are porn or fetish oriented. And one click is all you need to tell that the gameplay is near infantile. It's always some kind of puzzle game or generic time killer minigame. Playing through Furry Feet. Yep, there's Furry Feet, alright. These are nothing burgers of games in a sense. A sense that the honestly still too high price tag reciprocates. You just do a minigame and boom. And now chances are I probably look unhinged expecting deeper gameplay from a furry smut game. Well to that I say, you are simply weak-willed. If I need to use a video game to uh, entertain myself, I would hope that the game gave me a genuine challenge to overcome. None of that instant gratification, I want to earn my satisfaction. Also, uh, does the smut have to be there? Any furry game can do perfectly well without needing to include smut. But let's say for the sake of the furry coomer part of the brain, that is required. Well, allow me to show you one of the more mechanically deep ones I came across. Furry Cyberfucker, I'm not joking, is probably the one game of this batch I came across that required some form of mental brain power after pressing play. It's a quote, cyberpunk themed card game with some hot animated sex scenes, end quote. After what I've seen, I beg to differ. But at the same time, you've pretty much seen everything if you just look at the store pages gallery. This is another Furry Tales developed affair. The same people behind Furry Hitler, and let me just say, how are these both released in 2022? The gameplay is a direct upgrade from the usual drag and drop of the previous two. Here, you drag and drop with purpose. You can put a card on your opponent to do a normal impact, or drag it on yourself to activate the effect or equip the item. Yeah, that's about it. Still pretty simple, but hey. I at least wasn't starting to doze off during it, so that's a plus I suppose. Although looking back on it, I find myself having the same problem as the games that came before. There's nothing noteworthy or redeeming with these titles. You can play any one of these six characters they offer, but the experience is in most part just the same, just with the different variations of cards. I didn't want this to be a criticism I brought up frequently because it usually isn't fair to compare a game to what else is on the market, but all three of these games are cases where you could literally play a better version of this. Why play Furry Cyberfucker when Slay the Spire or Inscription exists? Why pay for Furry Hitler when you could simp over Leo and Echo for free? Kind of. Why play either of these when this gives you an actual game you don't have to turn your brain off to enjoy? Do I even want to talk about the sequel to Cyberfucker? As far as I'm concerned, this game does not exist. Do, don't, don't, do not bother with this title. Furry Sci-Fi 2 is the illegitimate love child of Furry Hitmonlee and Furry Sci-Fi 1. The gameplay of the first game returns in a slower, clunkier fashion. Also, collection is spelt wrong on the main menu. Also, what's a story mod? They didn't even try here. This game doesn't even have a logo this time around. It's just Unity. Some may call it lazy, but it's the perfect thing for computer science majors like me. The professor walks by and thinks I'm just working on Unity project when in reality, I'm really learning what defines a male as a male. Nano machines, I assume. I still can't get over the fact this is the opening line of the story mode. <laughs> as I said, there's nothing here. The game is rebalanced in a sense compared to the previous iteration, but it just feels so much slower to play. Your turns are limited, animations on everything feel just a bit too long. The story mod could be a rehashing of Cyberpunk 2077 for all I care cause I can't be bothered to play past the first level. It's a major slog with a disappointing payoff, even for the assumed Coomer demographic. But hey, 
at least I can sell Cyberfucker 5 on the community market. Because they couldn't even be bothered to properly name their Steam trading cards. I shrugged it off when Furry had really did it, but for a card game, that's unironically inexcusable. Furry Feet at least managed to name their Steam cards, which are going on the market too. Is it wrong for me to expect the bare minimum from what's essentially a browser game? Yeah, I can't say it is, honestly. Now, it probably sounds like I'm getting ready to end this video on a sour note, but be sure, I wasn't going to let this stop me. I was going to search Furry on Steam, and I was going to find a game that was worth my time. It was only a matter of when. Then I realized something. My search was being sorted by relevance. Maybe I could speed this process up if I searched by user reviews instead. It Takes Two is the award-winning co-op game. Yeah, my bias is about to show in spades here. If you've ever talked to me before, then you'd know that I'm an avid player of roguelikes. If you've ever met me in public, god forbid, we would probably sit down at a table, I'd place a laptop in front of you, and refuse to let you leave until you've clocked 100 hours into The Binding of Isaac, both versions respectively. So when I was searching for games and saw the dungeon crawler tag pop up, you can bet that this was going in my cart, regardless of if it made it in the video or not. Wally and the Fantastic Predators is a game where your best friend creates a dungeon for you to explore in hopes of cheering you up. This game describes itself as a wholesome, weird as heck, scrappy rogue light oozing with charm and humor. From the time I've put in so far, I can certainly attest to it managing that goal. To the more critical eye, the game can seem inconsistent at times. And while the difficulty definitely raises at a steady pace, most of the time, you might get thrown off by the stage progression not following any sort of specific theming, not really giving an overarching tale as you traverse deeper and deeper. However, like the others mentioned prior, this game wasn't exactly made with the critical eye in mind. It wasn't trying to compete with, uh, whatever the game of the year was in 2019. It's aiming to be a game for the sake of, well, being a game. Something you could say about the other games I've talked about so far, the only difference is, well, Wally actually gives you a game to play. It doesn't give you an error-ridden wankfest that somehow fails at the wankfest part. It gives you an actual experience to have fun with. You can feel actual personality throughout multiple avenues of the game, from the item descriptions to the shopkeeper, to the developer being in the hub world telling you what he believes makes a good roguelite. It feels like an actual labor of love, rather than a soulless cash grab that feels like the AI art equivalent to a video game. And yes, having personality is considered a low bar when talking about video games, but just stick with me here while I talk about the gameplay. The standard game is your usual dungeon crawler. You go from level to level, taking out enemies in a top-down, twin-stick shooter fashion. You get stronger by receiving pickups and weapons throughout your run. These upgrades can range from an increase in attack power, a chance to throw extra bombs for the price of one, or the box that never gets picked, that pleads for you to pick it out of the other available upgrades, showing visual anguish when you pick something else. As said, the biomes don't follow too much of a pattern as you go from a forest to a darker forest to ice lands to a space area to level but the difficulty, enemy variety, and weapon selection are definitely some of the more consistent portions of the game. And while the main game is pretty difficult on its own, there are more difficult alternatives as well as instant gratification modes that allow a player to have a less challenging form of gameplay while still keeping things entertaining. For 15 bucks, I'd say Wally's worth the spend. No bias whatsoever. The games I covered by the publisher Furry Tales gave me a hollow gameplay experience in exchange for bottom barrel wank material. The thing I found the most interesting wasn't even the games themselves. But the fact that I couldn't find a single thing about who is even behind Furry Tales. So rather than put more cash into a faceless seller I know nothing about, might as well put it into a game where I actually recognize the artist behind it. And later went on to regret it, but that's another story. Tailbound is a game developed by the not safe for work furry artist Carpet Worm. It's labeled as a lewd and gay, top-down, furry hack and slash adventure. Gameplay wise, it's the original Legend of Zelda but for those who stare at Octoroks a bit too long. Tailbound manages to answer the qualm that Furry Tales struck me with, a furry game that contains actual gameplay alongside its wink material. 
However, this answer was given to me from a monkey's paw, as while there is actual gameplay, there is no escaping the wank material as every character is bottomless for the majority of the game, resulting in quite a lot of blurring and editing for a video I already know for a fact is getting demonetized. So, the start of the game can pretty much be summarized by this Pokemon. Our Lagomorph protagonist, whom you name before the intro cutscene, is getting ready to attend a convention his friend invited him to. Once he arrives and is instructed not to touch grass, the venue gets enveloped in a pink mist coming out of the vents. Attendees who inhale this mist get uncontrollably aroused. Naturally, our protagonist manages to escape in time, waiting half an hour before exiting and laying witness to the bonding exercise that just occurred. You can't come on YouTube! This whole video's gonna get demolished! You find your way to a sword and a jacket before getting jumped by two kobold looking enemies who proceed to forcefully interact with you, ripping off your clothing and leaving you wearing nothing but the conveniently placed jacket just beside the conveniently placed sword, allowing you to enter the core of the game, that being top-down Legend of Zelda-esque gameplay. Alongside this is a tubble mechanic, where you can hit an enemy's weak spot before proceeding to hit their weak spot. However, getting hit by an enemy leaves you just as vulnerable, your lust meter filling up as enemies surround your downed body. It's not required to topple over and top your enemy whenever you can, but it does make the game incredibly easy seeing as doing the do with even the most basic enemy will lower your lust meter a little as well as fully heal you. Although personally this moves more into the problematic side of things when a few enemies are on the feral side of things, with one of the starting bosses literally just being a giant wolf with his wang out the entire fight. The game itself is created quite well, I will say that, but it's parts like this that made playing through this a one and done deal for me. Would I recommend it? Not really. The feral alone already conflicts with my own morals, but combine that with the developer's morals being lackluster in some worrying places, and you have me unable to give my approval in good faith. For me, this is legit just the Fez situation all over again. Game was entertaining for the most part, just wish the dev didn't put a bad taste in my mouth, among other things. I said previously that roguelikes are an easy ticket to getting me as a customer, but that doesn't mean I won't go outside of that comfort zone once in a while. When it comes to other genres of game, sometimes even roguelikes, there are usually two things that a game has to excel in for me to play it through. The lore and the soundtrack. It needs to have a story and characters that make me care about the world I'm traversing in, as well as a soundtrack capable of making me hyper fixate on the game, to the point I use it as the background to a commentary video. I've only played through the first chapter of The Crown of Leaves a couple of times as of writing this, and already, it has managed to tick both of these boxes. Being a game constructed by roughly five people, The Crown of Leaves is a point-and-click visual novel surrounding the happenings of our protagonist, Rui, a jeweler-turned-writer dabbling in the scientifically paranormal, who has to return to his homeland after having a run-in with the Mafia. His homeland, Latori, dealing less with science and more superstitious and mythical beliefs that don't really have much of a bearing, even in the setting of this game. Upon returning to Latori, he gets a commission from a local baron to create a bracelet to give his bride at their wedding. So the game opens on Rui attempting to create that bracelet, finding it hard to properly tend to the task. The rest of the plot we receive as we play through the game. Its style of point and click visual novel accenting its focus on story and world building. You know, assuming the Mindscape didn't do that already. This style of gameplay offers exactly what it sounds like it does, although I find myself choosing not to go further into detail in terms of plot as just the first of the two available chapters was enough to hook me. So I decided to treat this game the same way people treat the Outer Wilds. The best thing you could do is go into it yourself as blind as possible. If you had the patience and curiosity to learn about the lore built into the world of Crown of Leaves, you'll find something enjoyable and gripping. That will leave you wanting more because as I said, only two chapters have been released so far. The first was released in 2018, while the second was in 2021. The artists have stated how personal complications, as well as a certain global event, slowed down production of the third chapter, but that being said, it's most certainly on the way. It just needs a bit more time. And from what I've seen so far, personally, I can manage the wait. I mean, I did wait for Hive Swap's release after all. Patience is just kind of baked into me at this point. Personally, 
I think what we found here managed to perfectly capture the state of the furry fandom, in a sense that you have to dig through to find the good. Through the surface of the mindlessly horny, you start to find more quality. You come across the artistically gifted, those looking to brighten people's days, good concepts that have someone shady behind it. Why is that so common here? In the end, while I have more questions about the games I've come across, I can at least rest easy knowing that my question about the furry game market has been answered. Now I just need to know if there's a furry game out there that appeals to my exact gaming fantasy. That fantasy being the game genre that, to my knowledge, has yet to be tapped entirely. A horror rhythm game roguelike. My three favorite genres of game mashed into one. Crypt of the Necrodancer is probably the closest I've gotten, so let's see what the free equivalent would be. Nekomu's Potty Trouble is a one-player rhythmic video game. You must help Nekomu get to the toilet before he pisses on himself. God damn it. Funding for this program was made possible by...